right, so I'm going to go ahead and start then. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming. I really appreciate that. It's a great turnout. Um, that's what happens when you, I guess, give food. <laughs> I said I'd feed you twice, so this is the first one. The second time is going to be with knowledge. Um, it's interesting, too, because the way this started was actually at a lunch. I went to lunch with a few realtors in the office a couple of weeks ago, and we were just talking about the, the, the changes that were coming and the pitfalls that they saw and some of the concerns they had, right? And it dawned on me that what we've been doing for so long, and, and Simon has been great about this, is teaching you guys the X's and O's of what to do for the contract right now, right? The do's and don'ts. How did it change? How is this going to affect you? What you can and can't do, right? And that's great because that's the pre-game, right? You guys got to know all that stuff because you have to know how to talk to your clients. So we were talking at lunch, and it just kind of it was a question I threw out there. Because it hit me. I'm like, so uh, let's let's look at this in terms of the reality of what's going to happen once everything goes into effect, right? Because we know what's going to happen is we're still going to have competition on properties. We're going to still see people trying to outbid each other. And so what happens when the appraisal comes in low? What are your remedies to protect your commissions? Because you guys are all 100% commissioned just like I am, right? And we got to make sure whatever we get into escrow closes. And we got to do everything we can to keep it together. Otherwise, we don't get paid. And that's the chief thing is to make sure that we get paid, right? So what happens when you've done all of your due diligence with that buyer and they went to Chase? And Chase said, yep, they're pre-approved for a million-dollar purchase. They're going to be able to put 5% down. We verified they have the money. We verified that they had 2% for their closing costs. And we verified they have 2% to pay for your commissions because you have a buyer agreement with them signed, right? Because they're going to pay you 2%. Everything sounds great. Boom, we get into escrow and now we're running, processing the loan. We get the appraisal back in two weeks and it comes in at 980,000. You're 20,000 less. Chase tells a borrower, hey, we're good. You still have your 5%. You still have your 2% for your closing costs. And that extra 20 grand that's in your bank, you can give that to the seller for the premium, for the difference between the appraisal and the sale price, right? So the transaction can go through. One second. Yes, Jim. Just correct me from what, I, what I'm hearing. Are you telling me that our clients are going to have to qualify for 2.5% commission that they're going to pay? The bank is going to look at that? They're going to have to, yes. <laughs> We're going to have to. As a loan officer, we have to make sure that your clients are pre-approved, not just for the down payment and closing costs, but also the commissions. Because if you guys get yourself into a transaction, how are they going to pay you? Right? Because now they may not have to. I get it. Because the seller may give it to you. You guys are going to ask for that in your, your contract. But what if the seller says, no, pound sand, we're not going to give it to you. What do you do then? They still want to make an offer on the property. So you have to make sure that they have the commissions to pay you, right? Well, the appraisal came in low. So how do you make sure that you can still get paid? So just at lunch, we were collaborating. I want this to be a collaboration of you guys, too. What are your thoughts of what you can do? Any ideas? Jim? Uh, $3 million. Uh, you know, I, just, I just don't see it. You know, you could say whatever you want to say. No, I just don't see it happening. I think there will be a collapse in the in the market if this happens. And if we keep going with this, because on a three million dollar deal, what I'm doing right now, I got to tell my my people to come up with almost seventy thousand dollars extra to qualify. Potentially, but that's the, okay. you're right. But that's on a side. Let's stick to the point of what we're talking about. Who has any Who has any ideas of what we can do? Any ideas? I think the purpose for all of this is to adjust the prices down. So it will be more affordable for everybody. And maybe that 20000 the seller realizes the value is not there. Okay. So what are you going to so, do? So you're talking about going back to the seller and renegotiating, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's one option. You can go back and, and renegotiate. Anything else you guys can do? Can the seller pay down the rate? Possibly, but you've got to ask for a seller concession, right? You could possibly pay down the rate, Right. I'm sorry. Can you guys hear me out there? Hey, Chris, the other thing, if you could, when they ask the question, just repeat the question for us. Sure. Okay. All right. And then you possibly do an appraisal rebuttal, right? You can still do that. You can go to, to the bank and go back and say, hey, can we readjust 
the value, right? If we have a legitimate reason why they should do that, right? So we're looking at a potential rebuttal of the appraisal. We're looking at possibly premium pricing to the client, rebate pricing to pay their closing costs, generating more monies to pay for your commissions, potentially, or renegotiating, right? Absolutely. So those are the three areas you're probably going to attack first is to make sure you can do a rebuttal on the appraisal, rebate pricing, and renegotiate, right? Absolutely, you could do that. Well, let's look at them. So you're going to go back to the bank and say, hey, we want to do a rebuttal on that appraisal. Yeah, good luck with that. I got to tell you, an appraiser is like a king and queen. When he sets the value of that place, he's telling the bank that's what he believes based on his experience and his expertise. Now you're going to go back to him and he's going to have to say, you know what? I made a mistake. You're not an appraiser and your value that you thought was worth a million dollars is better than my opinion because this is what I do for a living. That's a hard thing to get done. I've asked for a lot of rebuttals and I've got shot down a lot, right? So I say good luck with the rebuttal, but that is an option for us. The second thing, we can go through rebate pricing. Okay, you could do that. But for rebate pricing, it's usually a poor, uh, one point is what you pay for a differential of a quarter to rate. So what you can do is charge the client a point extra on fee and they can take a higher rate, but you're not really gonna charge them a point, you're actually getting a point rebate. We're getting this back from the lender so that we can pay their closing cost. So we can increase their rate by a quarter, generating one point for the fees, which is gonna to go to your commissions, potentially. Or we can go, we need two points. You, once you get off the sweet spot when it comes to pricing, you don't get the same differential. So the second time you get, wanna get a point, it's not gonna be a quarter higher to rate, it might be a half higher to rate. So now you're looking at seven and a quarter of your clients to generate two rebate to pay for the closing cost, so they have monies left over to pay your commissions, right? But your client is ultimately gonna have to pay that, but that is a solution, you can do that. The problem with that is EPOs in a declining market. Anyone know what EPO is? Extra personal opportunity. I don't like that. So it stands for early payoff. So early payoff is when the lender does a loan and that loan gets paid off in six months. Guess what happens? They come back and they take the commissions out, back from you. So any loan I do, if that loan gets paid off in six months, the commissions I earned, I have to give it back to them. Can you imagine if you sold a house today and got a $20,000 commission check and within six months, something happened. They lost a job, they got a divorce, or a death in the family, something happened. They had to sell a house. And they came back to you and said, hey, I need my $20,000 back. Can you imagine you have to write a check three, four months down the road? That's what happens with the EPOs. And in a declining market, remember, we had to generate two point rebate to pay the closing costs. We had to jack that rate up to seven and a quarter, right? The market's at six and a half. It's going to slide. As it slides, more competition, more people are calling that client to get them to refi. But that is an option. Let's talk about renegotiation. Yes, you can renegotiate and go back to the seller, but there's no guarantee the seller is going to be willing to pay a less or take a less sale price or pay your commissions at the lower sale price still. So it could kill the deal. And we all know once we get the deal killed, that buyer has the potential of saying goodbye to us, right? We don't want to get out of escrow because if we do get out of escrow, they could go away. And now we lose not only that transaction, but any future transaction with that client as well. So here's what we can do. This is what's going to happen. But how do you guys protect yourself on a go forward? Get the listing. Change lenders. <laughs> Change the way you're thinking. Now, right now, I get it. Until last week, the seller paid your commission. It was a little easier sell to the buyers because they didn't really pay you, right? It was part of the contract the listing contract. So you guys got them and showed them everything, right? What, what is your opinion? What do you think when the buyers, buyers are not stupid, buyers are pretty smart. 
and they're going to see all this when I sit down with a buyer. What's going to stop them from saying, Jim, I'm sorry, you know, it's going to cost me extra to get qualified. I can't get qualified. I have to go directly to the listing agent because if I go directly to the listing agent, none of this matters. It does matter, but we'll talk about that in a little later. That's jumping ahead a couple of slides, but we're going to get there because that is a reality. They may go to the listing agent, but you're still going to have to, if you're representing buyers, to try to change the way you're thinking, change lenders, because if you stay with your bank, it's just their eyes, their guidelines. You have no way of doing anything because you have to do it within their guidelines. What you need to do is start thinking about using a broker because a broker has the ability to go everywhere. And the irony here is about 14 years ago, we went through our changes already. We came out, well, we didn't, but the government came out with something that was called the Dodd-Frank Bill. Yep. And they guide, the guidelines changed for us. They now regulated what we did in our industry. And it was a big adjustment when we made it. We thought at that point, the broker channel was dead. That was the final nail in the coffin because they were going to separate the appraisal from the lenders so we can no longer talk to the appraiser, right? We can no longer coerce the, the appraiser into giving us the value we needed to make our transaction work, which is what we're doing on a rebuttal, basically, right? We're going back to them saying, hey, you're, you're wrong. It needs to be a million dollars, not 980, so that we can get our commissions because that's really all I care, right? So you got to start thinking, hey, we need to be able to, to combat potentially what's going to be out there in the future. So let's talk about why you want to use a broker. The rebuttal? All right, we just submit to a different lender. I get a whole new appraisal. I don't have to do a rebuttal to that appraiser who brought it in at 980. I can do a new appraisal with a new lending company. That was the beauty of the Dodd-Frank bill is it separated the appraisal from the lender, right? So if you stay with Chase, Chase can order a new appraisal because they're one entity. If you stay with your mortgage banker that you work with, they order the appraisal. They own the appraisal because they have all the investors they sell on the back channel, but they can't order a new appraisal. They have to broker a file out. But if you're already using a broker and working with a broker, you just simply switch gears and say, okay, you guys are wrong on value. Let's just take it to a different lender and hope that you now have the comps to solidify why that appraisal should be at a million dollars if you get a new appraisal. Good solution. But how do you, how do you, how can you go from one appraisal to another? So one doesn't do a job right or one manufacturer? There's, there's two different companies, two different lenders. I brokered it. So I brokered it to XYZ Mortgage Company. They came back with the appraisal at 980. The appraiser was an idiot. We know that we have comps that solidify a million dollars. He's not going to allow it to go up to a million dollars because he doesn't want to look like an idiot to the company that hired him to do the appraisal, right? Because he gets his lead source from that institution. He's not going to say, yeah, yeah, I'm wrong. I'm stretching. Right. It's okay. This is not public record. We just simply went over to ABC Mortgage Company and submitted a new file with them and said, please order an appraisal on this file. They don't know anything about anything. The president doesn't know that there was a president done two weeks ago. Cops and proof. So, so the solution with the broker channel is you get a new appraisal instead of doing a rebuttal. Now, let's talk about EPO. Yes. We have a couple out here. Yeah. So, like that first appraisal, as a broker, if you get one, you don't like it. You go get a second one, you like it. Is that shared? No, it's not sure. So the question was, if I get a first appraisal and we don't like it because it came in at 980, and we went to a second company and it upset it over there and they brought it in a million dollars, do we share all this? Absolutely not. There's two different lenders, two different opinions of value, and the appraisal companies don't talk to each other. They don't know. They don't know. Let's say if you were to switch um, from one lender to another lender, that would just add time to your escrow, right? Correct. <laughs> Correct. Because you got to redisclose. So the question was, does it add time to your escrow if you're switch lenders? Yes. But it, but as a broker, you have the full packet. So as soon as I have a problem, I'm able to switch gears and send it to a different lender. Now we have to redisclose. So we have to put up smart fees. It takes about a day. Go direct. Right. And so. 
we have to redisclose so we can get to the appraisal, which takes about a day or two, and then a new appraisal is done, which you can order on a rush. Yes. Can you bottle and switch lender at the same time or no? You can, but I mean, you, you absolutely could if you wanted to. Sure. Right. But remember, the second appraisal is going to be at a cost because yeah. no one does anything for free. So if you do the rebuttal in the second appraisal, you still have to pay for the second appraisal. Right. And, but you'll have your choice if the rebuttal comes back, which I can tell you right now, it's slim to none and slip left town because yeah. trying to get a rebuttal is very, very, very difficult. So that's why working with a broker is better than going to a direct lender because so let's so let's talk about EPO because that's a real thing, guys. If we have to give a client a seven and a quarter rate in today's market, within two months the market is six and a half today. In two months, that could be at six percent because rates are going to go down starting in September. We already know that. Fed Powell said, "Yeah, we're here. We're going to decrease rates starting in September." We're just not sure if it's going to be a quarter or 50 point cut, but we know it's going to happen. And that's not the first, or I should say, not the last. It's the first of many. And so as the market slides, what's happening to this rate at seven and a quarter? Everybody who's out there getting trigger leads in the mortgage industry on the internet is calling that client to say, hey, look, the market slipped down to 6%. I can get you six and a quarter at no cost. Come in and refi. I know you just bought the house for three years or three months ago. You've only made two monthly payments. But if you come on in, I can lower your monthly payment by about $700 a month at no cost to you. How does that sound? Bad. Yeah. And guess, so guess, guess what happens to that loan officer? That EPO gets triggered. Once a mistake, twice a fool, right? So lenders are going to know this. So in the early on, some of them may not see the forest through the tree and do this until their commissions start getting taken away from them. And then you're going to see this go away. As a broker, there's a difference between lender paid and borrower paid. I'll be right to so most of the time, and I've been in banking now close to 30 years, but I've always been on the mortgage banking channel or at a bank. Well, I was paid by the lender. As my commission, it was lender paid. Lender paid me, right? And that's why the EPO happened, and I had to pay them back the commission if that loan got paid off within six months. In the broker world, we have a choice between lender paid and borrower paid. The difference really is how we disclose to the client. In a lender market, lender paid, there's no disclosure. It's just the rate, six and a half percent to them at no points. They're like, hey, great, six and a half, zero points, perfect. But the bank is paying me one point. So I'm getting my commission, right? That's lender paid. Now, borrower paid is I have to tell that client, I'm giving you six and a half percent at zero points, but that institution is paying me that one point. I'm just disclosing up front that I'm getting paid by them and how much. And because of that, it's called borrow or paid. And in our, in our realm, in the broker realm, there's several lenders out there right now that will do no EPO if it's borrow or paid. They won't give you a lot of commission back, but as long as they disclose it, whatever commissions that we get, we don't have to pay back. So now I can play in this, not have to worry about it because, well, if I have to go higher in rate to generate rebate pricing to pay their closing costs, so they can hold on to their closing costs so they can pay your commissions. Because at the end of the day, isn't that what we're trying to do? Is make sure your commissions are secure. That's what I'm trying to create for you guys, is make sure you get paid and we get paid. Because if we have to fall out of escrow, I just know I've been doing this long enough, but a lot of times the buyer goes away. And once that buyer goes away, we've lost them, right? And, and that's not what we want. So in the broker world, we can navigate through the rebate pricing. Yeah, the only thing you have to do is to disclose. Yep. Buyer, so then you don't right. have and that's us as a broker. You could pay less. Potentially. No. Potentially. It just depends on the rate. But yeah. Potential. Should they have to keep the, pro the property, for the loan for at least six to one nope. year before they mm -hmm. can refund nope. So they can turn around and refund us in the second week? Exactly. So, so the question they was, like, can they refinance within six months if it's borrowed or paid? There are a few lenders out there right now that tell us there's no EPO on borrower paid transactions. So any transaction we know that may potentially get refinanced, which we know this one's going to get refinanced, I'm going borrower paid. 
so I don't lose my commission and I still help you guys out because we're able to generate money to pay the closing costs so they can keep the money in the bank to pay you your commission because that's really what it's about. Coach, from the list from the selling agent and the loan officer goes back to the lender. Say that one more time. No, no, no. So no. whose commission goes back? There just the loan officer. No, no, just the, the, the oh. just loan officer. This is strictly on the loans. So it's just the loan officer who's going to have to give their commissions back. Yeah. And Bob, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Bob doesn't care. His cares. See, this is why I got him up here. Okay. And I didn't feed him, by the way. He got no food for me. So it's all EO only an issue if there's three day pricing. EPO is out there no matter what. Okay. Doesn't so matter if there's no rebate pricing, there's no rebate. Coming Doesn't back. matter. Anytime a lender is paying the loan officer, there's an EPO on that file that says if that loan gets paid off within six months, that the um, loan officer has to give the commission back to the lender. Right? So that, the same person that does that refinances with you, though, you're still sure you can do that potentially. Right. But you're losing the first by making another because the rates went down. Possibly. Yeah. But you now you're competing with internet pricing, and that internet pricing is really skinny, and you might not get anything or have to go in the red to keep that loan for the EPO. So you experience the internet pricing, you become a number again. People but it's a refi, like and it doesn't really matter. And the refi game, look, I tell you, we went through the pandemic, and the internet just took over. We thought the wholesale channel was dead 14 years ago. It is now thriving. And in fact, they own about a 26% market share. And the number one lender in America is United Wholesale Mortgage. They are a broker shop. They don't even have a retail outlet. They are the number one lender in America for the last three years. They will be again this year. I've gone to their corporate headquarters in Detroit. It's amazing what they have. These facilities are huge. It's like, have you guys been on the 60 going out to Beaumont on the way to Palm Springs and you see the Sketcher buildings? Yeah. Yeah, four of those buildings and they're complex and they house everyone there. Underwriters, processors. I mean, you name it, it's there. It's insane. It's a great operation, kind of. But the broker world is going to maintain the number one status for the next 10 plus years. And Matt Ashibi at UWM has got a vision and it it's... It's going to work. It's working. And the number two lender is Rocket Mortgage, which is another wholesale lender. Yes. Can you repeat how rebate pricing is going to work? Because some of us put in your use. Yeah. Okay. So rebate pricing means I'm going to give the client a higher rate to generate rebate or monies back to me. Let me, if you don't mind, I want to help connect the dots. Yeah. So I think sometimes it doesn't get articulated the right way. So mortgage brokers make commission just like you do, right? They don't make money unless there's a sale. So what we used to do in real estate was we work with a buyer and a seller, but the seller and the listing agent set the total commission that was going to get paid. Are you guys with me? Mm -hmm. So no matter what you guys were negotiating historically with the buyer, the price of the seller, those fees were already baked in. Is everybody get that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in the mortgage world, pre Dodd Frank, a mortgage broker got paid the same way. Similarly, they called back end points and front end points. Mm -hmm. So depending on the rate that you were getting as a borrower, dictated what the total points that the broker would get from the lender, in addition or over uh, and above what he would charge the borrower from. Right. So post Dodd Frank, it's changed now. It's not only has to be disclosed, but those margins don't exist like they used to. So let's right. just say on the rebate program as it relates in real estate, this would be the same as the sellers asking nine hundred eighty thousand dollars, but they're not paying a or offering any cobra. Are you guys with me? Yeah. So the option you have now is to, if your borrower isn't going to pay you out of pocket, which is an upfront point, that's what the same thing is. Mm -hmm. If they're not going to pay that out of pocket, you're probably going to get an offer for $100,000 so that you do get paid. It's rolled into it. And that's the same way that a broker works. And that's how the interest rates work. Exactly. So and, and, and to that point, yeah. just think if... The, the seller wasn't going to contribute and give you your 2% or 20,000 commission. It would be at 980 and the buyer pays your commission. But you say, wait a minute, what if I give you a million dollars and generate that extra $20,000 and then you pay my commission? Well, what, what's important is 
you got the $980,000, you have a price shopper. They got the $980,000 price, but they still pay $20,000. So I get the 6% rate, but I still paid one and a half points to get the rate. It's, it's, it's very similar. Right. And now to your point, it's on the screen. So the market rate right now is 6.5% at no points to the client. That's what they should get. Right. If if the house would appraise at a million dollars, we were locked in at six and a half percent. They were going to pay no points for it. They got that rate. How do you appraise the EPO as an agent? You, the EPO is not for you guys. Yeah, the EPO is only for the loan officer. But we have to know that because we're helping you through this transaction, and I help you through it, and all of a sudden I get burned because three months later it gets refied. I lose my commission. So how many times is the lender going to do that with you? <laughs> Once mistake, twice a fool, right? I'm going to do it with you once. And then when, as soon as I get my commission taken out of my paycheck or I write a check and I didn't get a paycheck, I'm no longer going to do that with another agent again when they say, oh, don't worry about it, man. Let's just close the transaction. No, 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 no. Because I'm the one who gets burned. You get your commission, you're fine. I'll be hitchhiking to work. Right. I'll be calling Jim to get to work. And I don't want that. So, so please. Everything that buys today and another six months rates go down, everybody's going to refinance. Yes. How are you going to police that? Uh, well, the, the lenders are policing themselves. I'm going away from that because I'm following pay. I'm not playing that EPO game, but I'm following pay. But going to that point, remember, it's six and a half and no points, but to generate monies. What we did is we said, okay, Mr. Buyer, I'm going to give you a rate of 6.75, and then the one-point rebate will come back to me, so it'll lose, it'll lessen your fees that you have to pay, right? And the reason why we're doing that is so that you hold on to more money in your bank because you didn't pay all those fees to pay your realtor, right? That's what I'm trying to do is help you guys by making sure they know they can take a higher rate and have no closing cost, right? And they held on to the money in their bank account so they can pay your commission. Buyers financing the commission. In a sense. Very in good. a sense. Correct. Right? But they were doing that anyway because, doing it anyway. because before it was built into the sale price because when you took the listing contract, it was built in for the commissions of the buyers. And there's the reason why they set the price at that point. Right? Buyers have, because now they have to pay the commission in their mind. And the price of the homes that were followed by the buyer's commission amounts, they're still the same. What's The question was, how do we, or how do I combat if a buyer is saying, um, well, actually, we're, we're going to let you ask that question later because th there's a form for that because this is really a collaborative uh, class because I don't really have that question so much to me. I have something similar, but it's on the lending side of it. And I can tell you how I answer the question. Right, because I've set my net worth. I have my script down. I know what I want to tell that client because I need to make sure that they understand the entire process. Right, but we're going to come back to that. That's a good question. Um, but let's go on because I don't want to lose too much. We've got about another 15 minutes. So we now know in the broker world, we can get a new appraisal if we need to. Right, that's great. We can avoid and get rebate pricing because we're going to go borrow paid. And then renegotiate, yes, you're probably going to want to do that at first, but it's not going to kill the deal. The seller tells you to go pound sand that you're, you're baked in at 980 and that's it, and the seller ain't going to help you. Well, we've got lenders out there that will do LTV stacking, which basically means we can put the commissions or your commission, the cost, into the loan without it affecting the loan to value. But we're going to table that. That's towards the end of this slide to show you how that works. So I just want you to know, I'm a broker. You guys should be calling me because I can get you guys out of this stuff. Look, if you keep on doing the same thing you're doing and talking to your lender at Chase because they have great rates, they don't have good rates. I compete with them. They told me when I worked at a bank and when I worked at a mortgage company, the reason why I shouldn't be a broker is because you'll never get the service. You won't get the support you need, Chris. It's just not going to happen. You're not going to be able to get anything done. You're going to call people and nothing will get done. And you're going to be all on your own, right? They lied to me. <laughs> I mean, I made the job about five months ago. They lied to me. They get better service now. We work with about 15 different mortgage companies. And I just happened to land at a great 
platform at Arbor. I didn't even know how big they were. I got to tell you, very few times in life you make that leap of faith. And when you land, you look around, and you're like, okay, this was bad. <laughs> this time I landed and said, holy schmoly, how did I get here? How did I land up here? It was, it was luck. Your luck, but I got there. Arbor is a great platform because they've got about 300 loan officers that all work on 100% commission. We're all 1099. We're brokered just like you. And the power of Arbor, we call it Arbor Nation. If we have a scenario, we throw it out into the nation and we get answers. They tell us exactly what, what company to go to and who the rep is, and here's their contact information. When I call that, that rep and I say, hey, this is Chris Rivera at Arbor Financial, I get a call back probably within a couple hours. And if he doesn't have an answer for me, he'll put me in contact with an underwriter. It's crazy. It is crazy. So you do need to get with a broker. My office, well, it's under construction. It's right there. <laughs> I used to joke, that's what happens when you don't pay bills. <laughs> but it wasn't that. Um, anyway. I'm still driving to work the one time. I am. Uh, I still get here. So, you know, we... We're talking about what's for in escrow, right? The practical of what's going to happen and how to make sure that your commissions get paid. And Simon and the staff has done a great job of teaching the X and O's to get in there, right? But we also talked at lunch as we went through this, well, to the question she asked earlier about the buyer agent commission and the agreement. And how are you guys going to be able to sell that to your client, right? Because you have to establish your net worth. You now have to tell them how much they should pay you on commission. And Brandon is really good at this. And I've heard this guy talk about his negotiation skills in his class. It's spot on. You have to be able to negotiate up front. You got to, in my opinion, you got to sell your secret sauce, right? Some other people call it your unique value proposition, you put whatever word you want there. For me, it's secret sauce, right? So I want you to imagine this. Imagine that legislation came down in the state of California that said it's mandatory now that any restaurant you go to, if it's a sit-down restaurant, you have to pay gratuity. And minimum is 5%. You're like, yeah, okay, well, I usually tip anyway, right? But now it's mandatory and I have to, right? And it's all negotiable between you and the company. Right, so it's your anniversary. You're taking your wife out, your spouse out to dinner at an Italian restaurant, and we're going to call it Brandon's Italian Bistro. And you get there, and you get there, and you walk in, and there's a sign: "Welcome to Brandon's Italian Bistro. We have the best food in the world, and we offer the greatest service." And right below it, it says, "Mandatory 25% gratuity added to every bill." What are you guys going to do? Right. And I got to tell you right now, I'm thinking like, I didn't even know if I wanted to tell you tonight. Like, I'm like 25%, right? I don't tip anyone 25%. Well, maybe once or twice in my life, but that's about it, right? So you have a choice to leave or stay there. But the person there knows exactly what's going on in your head. And this is where you have to have the secret sauce. You've got to be able to sell yourself, right? That's the whole negotiation is why they should pay you two, two and a half, three percent. You name the number, right? So it's the secret sauce. And they go on and tell you, hey, look, let me show you this video of what the experience you're going to get when you go behind these doors. Because we put you in a little bit of Italy, Tuscany region. And we have That's the best good. tomatoes, from the Tuscany region. We use nothing but spices from them. We're gonna pair it with the greatest bottle of wine you've ever had. And here's all our Yelp reviews, and this is what you get. See, they're selling the secret sauce to you. And pretty soon you see the video and you're like, whoa, I kinda like that. Okay, I'm out here at special occasion. Okay, looks like I'm gonna get a great service. The Yelp reviews, the people told me it's really good. I'm in, right? But if they don't stop you and show you why you should be staying there for the 25%, you're going to bolt and go Mexican because, well, I didn't even know I wanted to tell you. So <laughs> let me just show you something that came across my desk about a month ago. It's something Arbor does. It's about putting your best offer package because I really believe that you got to put your best foot forward, right? And the market has changed. How are you going to... Uh, 
distinguish yourself from your clients, or not from your clients, from your competition, right? Because you can keep doing the same thing and say, hey, I'll put you on my feeder. I met you at an open house and I'm going to drip campaign. So if you're looking for a property in Gardena or Torrance, whatever, you'll get it and we'll stay in contact that way. Well, people are doing that. You guys know Zillow's around, Redfin. I mean, I put in an address for Redfin and I constantly get updates for that zip code. Open houses, price changes, new listings, coming soon, all that stuff, right? They're doing your job already. So why are they going to pay you more? For me, I think that I need to be a little bit better than next. So the best offer package gives you kind of a step up. Let me kind of put this in here. And or package, meaning additional supporting documents like credit reports, Proof of funds, etc. Or alternatively, you can also utilize it cohesively with your realtor. Sorry, guys, but this thing is in my way. Yeah, there we go. What does BOP do or best offer package? It is a platform that you can pre approve your clients, generate your pre approval letter, and or or package, meaning additional supporting documents like credit reports, proof of funds, et cetera. Or alternatively, you can also utilize it cohesively with your realtor partners. They can have an account themselves where they can log into their portal. They can request pre-approvals from you. They can also write new pre-approval packages for them specific to certain offers they are looking to put together or properties they are going to offer on with our clients or mutual clients with them, um, as well as put together this cohesive offer package that you see here on the screen. It starts with a cover page that gives a synopsis of the client and or the realtor. It is branded to the realtor it goes over an offer summary page, which is extracted from the RPA that you upload to the offer package. And so there is no work that has to be done on the behalf of the realtor. It is just them simply uploading that purchase contract. And then it moves on to the pre-approval letter, which will cover all of the information needed suffice that condition, the proof of funds, and then the credit report, uh, also a spot for DU. And then of course, at the end, there is the purchase contract that you can then download out of the file here. Now you can also save this separately. So it's not in regards to the purchase con or the best offer package it is separate from the best offer package so that they have that accessible um, as you can see here we just click on the download button um, but we can also go directly right back to that offer package uh, we can also create a pre-approval package so it doesn't necessarily have to be an offer package um, this can be branded to you or the realtor as well just depending um, and this can include the following supporting documents, credit report, proof of funds, do you results, et cetera, as well. Okay. So it's an aggregator, basically. Yes. You run it through this system. Do or best You just run it through this system and it assembles a package for you that then gets sent to the listing agent that they can then see all that. I, I got an offer on one of my listings that was similar to this. Yeah, and, and so there's more to it. I want to show you more videos, but it's just really designed for you guys to put your best foot forward. If you're going to write an offer, you guys should be showing the listing agent or seller proof of funds, proof of FICO score. I can, I can even put in there a pay stub. We're going to be able to redact all that stuff. The beauty is, and I don't want to show you the video just because we're running out of time, that your custom, you get your own account. So when you, like Jim, has thrown me four borrowers, right? So I've pre-qualified all these buyers and they, they're in Jim's account. 
Now it's on a weekend and Jim needs a pre-approval letter. He just goes into his account. He looks at John Doe. John Doe's good for 900,000 with 5% down. He's gonna write an offer. He can just send it out. He doesn't have to contact me. He's got the total ability to do that. But it's there, once it's in there, it's there. So when he throws me four more next month, now we got eight in our system, right? And now six months down the road, when we have 20 borrowers that are pre-approved, he doesn't have to call me and say, what is that guy? Remember that guy four months ago, John Doe? What was, what was he qualified for? It's already in the system. It, it shows you exactly what his pre-approval stuff was and you can write the offer. Now we may have to update stuff, but as we get the updated pay stubs or bank statements or whatever it might be, I can redact the information and put it in there so you can uh, attach it. Two, two quick questions. So, Bob, when you got that offer with that, was that going to make you feel any better about that liar? No. No? No, you weren't, you weren't impressed? And Frank was impressed? Was I impressed? Well, yeah. It was easier to, there was the overview of. Yeah. What the terms were which i appreciate that Bye. and scroll down there's the pre-approval letter okay there's the evidence of funds and here's the rpa great so it was a better presentation than it was a better presentation than you will usually see right. from most hack agents that, that's where i was going and then second so Un this unfortunately the conversation uh, in particular chris so <clears throat> if i represent bob and you pre-qualified him up to nine hundred thousand. And we found a property uh, that's on the market for 875, and we're writing an offer for less than that, and you're not available. Can I edit what it is so the pre approval letter is only coming to the yeah. amount I'm writing the offer on instead of 900,000? Yes, yeah. as long as it's below the max. Okay. Yeah. So we do have that capability. You have the capability as long as it's below the max. If, if I set it at 900, that's where it's at, right? You can't try to override it to 925. But you can't go to 875, 850, 800, you're fine. Just send me a PDF, Chris, and I'll edit it. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I've done that. But I guess it's in trouble. It's not, it's not a good solution, I can tell you that. So um, that's the best offer package. I was going to show you how you can add it and edit. I don't really want to go through all that stuff. We don't have to, uh, time. And then there's another one, how to do it. I'll sit down with you guys if this is something you guys would like to do. I just think that you guys need to have your own special sauce, whatever that is, because you guys are at the front line. You guys are talking to the buyers, and, and you have to have your script down as to why they should pay you X, right? Because I've got mine. I can tell you when a client calls me, I don't really talk rate and points too much. I'm usually talking structure and ability and why they should use me. They just hear it in my voice because I'm gonna tell them everything they need to know about getting pre-approved and options and the market direction, right? And all that stuff, the different loan programs. And then when we get to rate, yeah, we can compete with rate because I'm a broker. I'm gonna make sure you're getting the best rate. So I know you're thinking, well, what, you know, how am I gonna get you off Chase? Because they work with Chase. They got their mortgage guy, right? They've got their people. Look, it's an easy script. I used to tell people that, you know, if, if it was me referring someone, I want to refer you to Chris Rivera over at Arbor Financial. I've been working with him for 10 years and people love him. He knows what he's doing. And I get that you have a great relationship with John over at Chase Mortgage. But Chris is going to do one or two things for you. One is either going to show that John's giving you great terms and rates, or he's going to be able to beat John over at Chase. Isn't that worth 10 minutes of your, of your time to get to make sure that you're getting the best terms for your transaction? Easier to say Chase sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it would be. You're going to be chasing your loan office. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what you're doing with Chase. Exactly. So, guys, we're in it together. Um, this is what I do. I'm right here. I can't run from you guys. I want to protect your commissions. I want to help you if you guys want to do this. We'll, we'll, we'll talk more about it later. But I do want to get in the last couple of minutes what LTV stacking is and what that means is we're able to put your commissions potentially into a loan, right? And so basically, if, it, if, if the seller doesn't want to pay, the appraisal comes in low, we can potentially do this. So you can finance your brokered stuff in it to help the borrower. It doesn't affect their loan to value, so they get the same rate. They don't get triggered with MI, that sort of thing, right? Ask Chase will come with that for you. They will not. <laughs> now, the thing is, this is not a Fannie or Freddie Mac program. 
It's not FHA, it's not VA yet. This is the first chink in the armor. This is the first one I've found, but it's only on non-QM loans. And right now you might say, well, what is in the QM loan and non-QM doesn't sound like something I do. You do them. So QM stands for Qualified Mortgage. I talked about the Dodd-Frank bill earlier. They set the, uh, the requirements of what we have to do as lenders to be able to do a loan, ability to repay and that full documentation. The non-QM sector was our old subprime, the alt A type products. You guys do these loans and you don't even know your borrower is doing them. Investment loans, all investment loans, not all, that's, that's absolute. Most of all investment loans, are doing this DSCR loan. It's just an easy qualification. It's the same rate. It's better than a full doc if they go the old school. So if you handle any investors or if you take any investor, they're probably doing that DSCR loan. It's in the non-QM sector. And right now it's about 16%-ish of all transactions are investor loans, right? So we know at least a sixth of the market, 16%, is in the non-QM sector. But there's other ones. Do you guys help self-employed borrowers? They're doing bank statement, they're doing P&L, they're doing one-year tax returns. People don't wanna put 20% down in their jumbo sector, they want 10 or 15%. That's the non-QM sector. Asset depletion. Some of these lenders, they will do hybrid and let you join to. I've got one right now, it was a sale price of $3 million. Client wanted to put 25% down. He doesn't qualify full doc. He, he has a good income, makes about 350 base, $50,000 bonus, and he had $80,000 from other places that you can't really use. 400,000 sounds like a lot of money. That's about $33,000 in income. It's not a lot, but the PITI at 2.2 was $18,000. So his PIT or his DTI debt to income ratio was 52%, couldn't get it approved. I was able to do an asset depletion because the guy had two and a quarter million dollars liquid in the bank. It was only using 775. So the leftover of 1.5, I was able to use that on an asset depletion and got the guy about $20,000 in just asset depletion income. And then I threw in his personal bank statements because I couldn't show his tax returns. So we showed his personal bank statements and he was getting $10,000 every pay period because the guy had good income, right? So now I've got $20,000 from personal income from his W-2 job, and I got $20,000 from his asset depletion. I got $40,000 in income each month for qualifying. DTI went down to 42, approved, Boom. right? Non-QM sector. This sector right now is probably about 25% of all loans that are being done. So it's a bigger sector than you think. And this LTV stacking is in here because they don't have to adhere to the Fannie and Freddie guidelines. They're not the Dodd-Frank bill. This is kind of the old Wild West in a sense. It has to make sense, and they will do it. But this is, to me, the first of many. A thing funny will eventually get there. It's going to take quite a number of quarters, but they'll get there. Yes, exactly. But they will get there. So, guys, I ran over about four minutes. Uh, hopefully, you guys got a good nugget or two. And you can see the value proposition that I bring to you, which is being a broker in this office, is going to allow you to navigate through this and, and avoid the pitfalls of your commission. Because bottom line is I want to make sure you're paid just like I'm paid. So that's it.